Good evening and happy Wednesday to each one of you that's joining with us this evening for our weekly Bible study here at the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm so glad you've chosen to be with us today as we study God's Word together. Uh, before we begin, let us say a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything you do for us, for all that you are. And we thank you so much for your word that you have given to us. And I pray for each person within the hearing of my voice, Lord, that we may be able to study your word so that we may be able to know you better. I pray that as we study today, that your Holy Spirit will guide us as we seek to learn from you. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to welcome those that are joining with us for the first time. If you haven't studied the Bible with us, your church family here at the Redmond Seventh-day Adventist Church, a very warm welcome to you. And if this is your first time, uh, my name is Reggie Samuel, and you'll be st we'll be studying together Hebrews. Now, normally how I do this is I'm reading along almost with you. Yes, I've looked at this chapter prior like you have but I have not written down any notes. I'm not trying to get through a particular set of verses. Uh, I want to approach this Bible study as if we're looking at it together. And uh, I have no agenda to make sure I finish a chapter in this particular session. We may only read through a few verses if that's as far as we get. So I hope this will be dynamic. It's not something I have a screen over here telling me what to say. Uh, I'm hoping that we can just study the Word of God together. Uh, so as I say that, you may find times where I'm looking for words to say or uh, not sure what the correct way to express something is. And that's because I'm literally studying along with you in this book and any of the other studies. That's how I like to approach it. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy the study with us. Let's go ahead. Let's jump into Hebrews chapter one. And it is power packed, verses one through four. I'm, it's possible that's all we're gonna get through today. Uh, but let's go ahead and start. Hebrews chapter one, verse one. And it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Now, um, Paul is writing here to advise us, to let us know that God speaks to us, to His people, through His prophets. Now this is important for us to understand because we see that God uses um, a particular group, which He calls prophets here, people God communicates to directly, in order to communicate His message to the rest of His people. Now, in God's providence, He could easily, in God's power, He could speak to each person the way He wanted to individually and give them a certain uh, word. But God chooses to use prophets who are people. They're not special gods. They're not special beings. They're human beings like us, but whom God has called to be His prophet. And that prophet will then have the responsibility to properly and accurately reflect and repeat God's message to the people. Now we find that all through the Bible. I mean, that's what this is, whether you're in Isaiah or Jeremiah, or you're reading the Psalms and prophecies found in Daniel. Here, God is speaking to His people because He does not want us to be left in the dark. All right? This is so key. When we talk about a God who reveals, that's why Revelation says this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. The whole Word of God is a revelation of God Himself. And as such, God does not want to necessarily be enshrouded in mystery and misunderstanding in uh, a way that He is like what Paul said to those that He met, to the unknown God. He wants to be a known God. And the way He does that is by speaking to God. His people through His prophets, which is why it's not unusual to think that God would have a modern-day prophet as well. And for those that are Seventh-day Adventists, we do believe that there is a prophetess in Ellen White, which is not a far-off idea, because God has spoken at various times and in various ways to people through His prophets. Now, we find in Isaiah, they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them, that is for sure. And so, we should not esteem a prophet higher than God. We should not esteem a prophet as if uh, they are God on earth, by no means. 
prophets are still servants of the one true God. And so if their word does not align with what God has shown to his people, well, then we know that prophet is not a true prophet. But I, as Paul begins this message, he's saying, look, the reason I'm saying this is because you're, I'm going to show you through the rest of my letter here, the rest of my sermon here, how God has spoken to us in the past that makes what's happening in the present clearer. That God is not going to do anything unless He tells it to His people, because He is a God of revelation. And so then he continues in verse 2, And God has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds. Now, two things we find here. He says, He has appointed His Son. Now, we study this in the Gospel of John, the usage of the word Son. And I want to stay here for a moment because it is what's going to make the rest of not only the Bible, but specifically here in Hebrews, this idea of sonship is central to the Bible. All right. So uh, I may only get to verse three today. It's possible. I'm not sure. But when we talk about this son, it's so confusing to so many people and it's so misunderstood because people think of Jesus as God's actual son, as if God the Father gave birth to Jesus Christ, his son. But the reason Jesus is called the son is because he fulfills the role of the sonship. What is this sonship? Well, it is based on the promise found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And Genesis 3.15 is where God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. This seed is referring to the descendant of Eve. There was to be a redemption that would occur through the lineage, through the descendants of Eve. And this promised son was going to be the one who would redeem that which was lost by the first son, Adam. And as we go on through uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 through the end, it's going to talk about this idea of a son. So I don't, I'm not going to get too far ahead of myself, but keep in mind that this promised son is now speaking, is now the one that will show us what? The revelation of God, showing us more about who God is, which is what the prophets were also doing that were found in the Old Testament. And the further identification of this son is uh, that it is in there in verse 2 where it says, He has appointed heir, he was the heir of all things, through whom also the worlds were made. And that's similar to what we find in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, right? He was the one through him all things that have been made were made. And in him all things consist. So this son, as Paul is trying to help us understand, whoa, there's something about this son. I mean, he made the worlds. Through him all those things were made. That's why he is important. And that's what Hebrews is going to get to... to um, show us, to extrapolate for us of how important this message of Jesus Christ is and how it's not something just found in the New Testament, but it is something that has been pointing, something that has been progressing from the Old Testament. It begins there and it culminates in Jesus. And he's going to make the case for that. And then it continues. Who being the brightness of his glory, it's still talking about this sun, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the power of, uh, by the word of his power. Paul makes it clear here that this son is the express image of his person, that is of God. Uh, that term express image is used in the Greek when they would talk about uh, stamping coins from a die. You know, you have coins and you're trying to make more coins. You use that same die to replicate so that every coin is the exact same as the previous one. 
Likewise, this son who has yet to be identified to us as Jesus, we said, well, this son uh, that is there, that has come, he is the express image of God. And that's why I remember when Jesus says, he who has seen me has seen the Father, because I am the express image of God. What Hebrews is going to do is going to put different pieces of the puzzle, lay it out for us, and then see how they all fit together. And that's why it's important for us to look at the Old Testament and the New Testament. If we do not look, if we uh, exclude one or the other, we only have pieces to the puzzle. We do not know what the actual picture looks like. And Hebrews is going to help us put all those pieces together so we can see one beautiful image. All right, let's keep going. And he says, When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels. Here we see that this son, he is able to take away, and the word, word purge is really to cleanse us from our sins. Well, this will just take us back, if you've been with us and studying with us, take you back to 1 John. 1 John tells us that uh, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. And then it says, in, uh, let's turn there, or I'll have it on the screen for you. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our sin is taken away. Our sin is cleansed by the Son. So what are the things that identify the Son? He's communicating to us a message. Previously, God spoke through His prophets. Now He's speaking through His Son. His Son is one who has made the worlds that we have. He is uh, the brightness of God's glory, the express, that is the express image of God's person. Uh, and when we have seen the Son, that means we have seen the Father. Uh, they are both the same. And... He has cleansed us of our sins. This Son has done all of those things. Makes Him, after you put all these things together, better than the angels, of higher rank, that is, than the angels. Because the angels did not put the worlds together. The angels did not create the earth and the planets and the solar system and the universe. The angels do not hold all these things together. The angels do not cleanse us from our sins. But this Son, this Son has done all that. This Son has done all of that. Well, then the readers of this first three verses must be thinking, well then, okay, uh, well, how do we know that this is the promised Son? How do we know uh, that this Son is better than the angels. What makes him different? Okay, you've told us all these things, that's great, but I'm a Jewish Christian and I need to know more. Tell me how you're able to conclude that this son is the promised one from Genesis 3.15, the Messiah whom we have been waiting for. I cannot simply throw away all that I have learned from Genesis to Malachi. God has shown us so much and revealed so much that He would not just simply do away with that. I tie it all together for me, Paul. And that's what Paul is going to be doing in verses 5 through 14. He says, For to which of the angels did He ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. This is a quotation from Psalm chapter 2, uh, verse 7. Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. Now, this is a curious thing, right? Uh, when we apply this to the Messiah, it says, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And then it says, 
I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. It doesn't say, as you say, I am his father and he is my son. It says, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. A declaration that this is my son. This is going to be my son. Now this makes an enormous difference because the way we understand the son affects, like I said, everything. If we think that Jesus is just simply someone who God the Father gave birth to, well then he had a beginning. But the reason the Bible chooses to express to us something that's divine in earthly terms is so that we can understand the relation that God is trying to portray to us. The usage of saying that today you are my son, today I have begotten you, it's like, I am declaring, now you are the Son. You are the promised one. And through this Son will the promises of the Old Testament be fulfilled. Now I hope that makes sense. Jesus did not have a beginning. Jesus became the Son of God in order that He would be able to redeem His creation. He takes on the sonship in order to redeem the human race, to return to the human race that which was lost by the first son, Adam. I hope that makes sense. And then he continues in verse 6. He says, let all the angels of God worship him. Again, a reference to the Old Testament. Uh, if you remember, when the angel comes to Daniel and then Daniel tries to bow down to the angel, the angel says, no, 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 don't do that. Uh, don't worship me. I'm just a messenger. But in this case, there is one whom the angels worship. The angels of God worship him. It doesn't the angels of God worship God. It says they worship him. There's this son. And that's why he's greater than the angels. The angels do not be, cannot be worshipped. Only God can be worshipped. And this son is one to whom the angels worship. Now I'm going to go down to verse 8. And he says, But to the son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Here is the taking on of the role of sonship. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, takes on the role of the Son, not because He was born of God, but simply because He chooses to take on our nature, He chooses to take on our flesh, He chooses to become the promised Son of God for your sake and my sake. So it's not talking about etymology, it's not talking about the beginnings of God. It's talking about the sonship that Jesus Christ takes on, the role that Jesus takes on in order to redeem his people. And then verse 10, it says, You, Lord, in the beginning lay the foundation of the work, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Again, saying that this Son is also the Creator. He's called the Son, but he's also the Creator. He is God. And then finally, verse 13, taken from Psalm 110, verse 1, it says, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The case that Paul is making here, here is that this is not just an angel. This son is not an angel. God did not send an angel to save us. He sent himself to save us. And, I, and what the first beginning of Hebrews is, the case it's making is, look, this is not an angel. It's someone better than an angel. I'm not saying it's God yet. I'm just saying it's someone better than an angel. It's someone who has created the worlds. It's someone who people, even, who even the angels worship. Trying to get his readers to understand, let me take you step by step. He's not a mere man. Nope. But you may think he's an angel because it's supernatural. But I'm going to tell you that he, this promised son, is better than the angels, is outranks the angels. And here is the case I'm making for it. And remember, 
In Psalm 110 verse 1, it actually begins this way. It says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. A curious way of uh, the psalmist to write something like this. For David to say, the Lord said to my Lord, <laughs> sit at my right hand till I make your, uh, your enemies your footstool. Um, this sh showing to us, revealing to us this messianic psalm of God is saying to God, Sit at my right hand. Uh, this son, Paul is saying, is, is better than the angels. He's so much greater, so much um, more powerful. He's the creator. He's the express image of God. He has been worshipped by angels. Things have been said about him that has never been said about an angel. So for those of you that think he's just an angel, he's not. How do we know? Not because the gospel said it, but because the prophets said it, those of the Old Testament. You see, the veracity of the New Testament is only pure and true because of what is said in the Old Testament. The New Testament stands on what is said in the Old Testament. And Paul understands this, so he says, look, it's been told to us from ages past, thousands of years before, that it's going to be God who is going to be our Redeemer. He is the Lamb of God. God is the Lamb of God. He is going to provide for Himself a sacrifice. Himself. And when we said that, you know, uh, she'll bear a son and we shall call him Emmanuel, which is God with us, it literally meant God with us. And, and here, Paul just wants us to get the idea, look, He's not an angel. He's better than the angels. But then all of a sudden, and when we get to Hebrews chapter 2, he's going to say, but then he was made lower than the angels. Thank you for joining with me for our study today. I hope that you'll uh, join with us next time as we look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Go ahead and take a read. Let me know in the comments below what you thought about Hebrews chapter 1. And of course, always take a moment, click on that like button, and if you haven't already, click on that subscribe button so you're always aware of when we have a new video posted. God bless you and be with you, and I will see you next week.